We have the gift of two scripture passages this morning. The first from the Gospel according to Matthew, continuing the genealogy of Jesus in chapter 1, verse 6. And the second from 2 Samuel, chapter 11. Hear now God's word, beginning in Matthew 1, verse 6. And Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David was the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah. 2 Samuel 11. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house. And the woman conceived. And she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah dwell in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live, And as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank, so that he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house." In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter, he wrote, Set Uriah at the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him, that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. Then Joab sent and told David all the news about the fighting. And he instructed the messenger, When you have finished telling all the news about the fighting to the king, then, if the king's anger rises, and if he says to you, Why did you go so near the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, the son of Jerubasheth? Did not a woman cast an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died at Tebez? Why did you go so near the wall? Then you shall say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent him to tell. The messenger said to David, the men gained an advantage over us and came out against us in the field, but we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. Then the archers shot at your servants from the wall. Some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. David said to the messenger, Thus shall you say to Joab, Do not let this matter displease you, for the sword devours now one and now another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it, and encourage him. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah her husband was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. 
morning, everyone. We're in the season of Advent, as you know. This doesn't feel like a very Advent-ish series, does it? Um, It's called The Misfit Mothers of Jesus, and we're looking at the women in Matthew's genealogy of Jesus. And um, what, what we've seen so far is a lot of trial, heartbreak, suffering, and sordidness that continues this morning. And so why is it that Jesus' genealogy is, it includes five women, and each of these women is in their own strange predicament, their own sordidness. And we're, we're missing one. We're not talking about Rahab, who had the oldest profession in the world. And so why is it? Well, I think the reason why Matthew included these women, specifically in Jesus' genealogy, is because Jesus came from sinners to save sinners. Jesus came from sinners to save sinners. And that is really good news. Amen? And and one of the challenges of preaching about Bathsheba in particular is that the story is actually much more about David than it is Bathsheba. And so as we look at this text, um, it's it's a challenge to look at Bathsheba. We will but we're going to look at some of the men that this, this text engages, like David, and, and then we're going to look at her husband, Uriah the Hittite, and, and then we're going to look at a, a prophet who confronts David as well, and then we'll conclude by looking at Bathsheba and why her life matters and why she's included in the long line of people. Only five women, but one of the five women included in, genus, in Jesus' genealogy, which is very, very good news. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, we, we pray. I pray that my words would be your words and that you would give me um, everything that I ought to say. I pray that you would help us as we approach this topic and um, this, this terrible event in the history of your people, that you would enlighten our, the eyes of our hearts, that you would give us soft hearts to hear what the text is saying so that we might repent where we need to repent so that we also might be encouraged where we need to be encouraged, where we might be feeling um, low. And so, Lord, we ask for uh, you to send your Holy Spirit so that we can um, respond to the text in a way that glorifies you. And so that we might know your grace all the more. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the Bible is very, very honest. And it spares no one um, David is an archetypal king. That means that he is the ultimate expression of kingship in the Old Testament. And yet, we see right here that he is actually a very wicked king. And that comes as a huge surprise for anybody who reads up until this point in 2 Samuel 11. Because what have we seen so far? We've seen good things. We've seen that David is a shepherd, a lowly shepherd. That was not a high status job. And he's the youngest of eight sons. And as the youngest of eight sons, he is the least likely to be uh, ordained and anointed as king. In fact, his dad, when he assembles all of the sons for Samuel, the, the guy who the, the book is named after, who is a judge, when, when Jesse, the father of David, assembles the sons, he forgets to bring David. That's how unlikely he is to, to be anointed as king. Nevertheless, he is. And then right after that, we have the greatest underdog story in the history of humankind, right? David and Goliath. And David, this young man, takes down this nasty, probably very ugly, tall, burly uh, Philistine warrior named Goliath. And he does it not for his own glory. He does it because he is zealous for God's glory. And Goliath is taunting the Israelites and saying that their God is not strong enough to defeat him. So he, he goes and he defeats him, and that sets him on this, this incredible trajectory. He becomes this uh, skilled warrior. He's also a musician, and he writes psalms. I mean, the, the guy's got it all. He's good looking, and he, he does all of these things for the king until the king, King Saul, gets insanely jealous of him and wants to kill him. And even then, when he attempts to kill him, David, over and over, David will not do the same to Saul. And there are two very clear instances where David has the chance to kill Saul and he won't do it. He will not because vengeance belongs to God. And this is the kind of man that um, 
Samuel describes when he tells Saul, Saul, you're not going to be king anymore. And this is what he says. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. That's what Samuel the judge says to Saul. And he's describing David. He was a man after God's own heart. And then we see what happens in 2 Samuel 11. And that should be an instructor to all of us. Uh, you might be in a, a great place right now in your faith. You might be walking with Jesus, following him faithfully. You might be doing wonderful things to serve the Lord. But, but just know that there is temptation all around. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. What that means is that no matter how far along in your maturity as a Christian, you better be on guard against temptation and against sin. And in this hinge point for David's life, he is not on guard against temptation and sin. It says in verse 1 in 2 Samuel 11, it's the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle. And what's David doing? He's not at battle. He's lounging on the couch. Okay, he's... He's, he sends Joab out to go fight the battles. He's supposed to be there with them. Instead, he's at home. And you might think, well, maybe he's got a lot of administrative work to do or something. No, he's taking a nap. Now, it's not bad to take a nap, and sometimes we get tired, and I don't mind taking a nap every now and then, but it's clear from the text that David is idle and bored. And so what does he do? He goes out on the roof. He, he assesses his kingdom, and he sees someone. It says that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And the Hebrew word there for very beautiful is not used very often at all. It's very rare, and it just means, of course, a, a woman of incredible beauty. And just a, un, un, a very rare beauty. And he sees her, and um, you know, there's a passage in James that talks about temptation in this, in this regard. And um, I, I want to show it to you. This is how James, the brother of Jesus, put it. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. It begins with sinful desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And that is absolutely the trajectory of David's life right here in this chapter. It's evil desire and then sin, and then the consequences are absolutely devastating. And this is a, a very important point. Sexual sin begins with the heart and the mind, not actions. It begins with the heart and the mind, and then it goes to actions. But make no mistake, sin begins in the mind, and it's not harmless, and it's not innocuous. That's why Jesus said, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has committed adultery in his heart. That is a very high standard, and that is the standard that all of us have as Christians. And it is absolutely abundantly clear that we live in a world that is at war with that idea, okay? Uh, you're familiar maybe with the book Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis? It started as a series of radio addresses um, to, in England, and he gave the addresses in 1942, which is, quick math, 80 years ago, and he was talking about the environment in which they lived and how out of balance and perverted, frankly, the culture was in his time. And the, he used an analogy, and this is the analogy that he used. He says, suppose you came to a country where you could fill a theater simply by bringing a covered plate to the stage and then slowly lifting the cover so as to let everyone see, just before the lights went out, that it contained a mutton chop or a bit of bacon. Would you not think that in that country, something had gone wrong with the appetite for food? Do you understand the analogy? 80 years later, how are we doing? The, the perversion that is the, the water in which we swim is um, absolutely horrible. And 
I, I want to lay out for you what the positive vision is, okay? This is the positive vision of desire and sexual purity in the Christian life. It's called chastity, and that comes from the Latin word chastitas, and this is what it means. Purity outside of marriage, before marriage, during marriage, and freedom to desire only one person within marriage. That's what, that's what the calling is for every Christian, whether you are a young man or a young woman or an old man or an old woman, whether you're single or whether you're married. The Bible does not disparage desire. It puts it in its proper context, outside of which it is incredibly destructive. So you've maybe heard this analogy before. Do you like to have a fire in your home? I do. In the fireplace. It's really nice. It's cozy. It's warm. Anywhere outside of the fireplace, it's really bad because it's going to burn the house down and cause devastation and destruction. And that is exactly what sexual desire outside of its proper place does. It brings about immense destruction. And so I want to speak um, first to the men who are here, to uh, young men, to middle-aged men, to old men. If you are going to grow in your spiritual maturity, if you are going to be the man that God wants you to be, then you need to know something, okay? You need to know that this sin and how you deal with this sin is going to be a, just like it was a hinge moment in David's life, it is a hinge moment in your life. It is a, a, an issue that you absolutely have to address. And there are so many men who do not battle hard enough in this temptation. I mean, it's, it's interesting that um, Dave and Linda Wallace presented this ministry this morning out of darkness, that rescues women who are stuck in sexual trafficking. There's one reason why that ministry exists. Do you know what it is? It's one word, demand. If there were no demand, there, there would be no need for out of darkness to rescue women. But there is demand, and that comes from men. Do you know that there, I, I don't know of a ministry that is striving to get men out of the same issue. Just, it doesn't exist. So, men, and, and um, is that the issue in this church? I don't know, I certainly hope not, and I really don't think so. But um, when you look at statistics about pornography and adultery and sex outside of marriage and before marriage, it is absolutely an issue in this church. There are men in this church and young men in this church who are dealing with those issues, those sins. And they're dealing with it secretly, and it is absolutely eating you alive. And so what do you need to do? You need to repent. And you need to find people around you who love Jesus and who you know and who you can be in loving accountability with. And maybe you need to go to counsel. I don't know. Maybe you need to, but, but you need to repent. And if you are in a relationship that is um, Outside of the bounds of, of what, what I just described, marriage between a man and a woman, then, then you need to get out and you need to repent. Uh, it's very well known that we, um, we support and defend what the Bible teaches about sexuality. That is the uh, cultural issue of our time where the culture is pressing against it. We are very, very clear in what we believe. Um, but it is worth noting that the most devastating sins of our time within the church related to sex are heterosexual in nature. Okay? They're lust and pornography and adultery and sex before marriage and if the stats are to be believed, as I said, this is a problem here. And if I may, I want to also speak to the women. Um, this is not an issue that comes into play in the text. I do not think that Bathsheba was at fault because the text doesn't describe any way in which she was at fault. But I do want to say to you women, young women, middle-aged women, older women, uh, modesty is a wonderful thing. 
And I know it's hard. I know, like, going to the, you can't find clothes for uh, middle school, high school, college kids that are not immodest, basically. I mean, it's so hard to find clothes. But I, I want you to know that that's an important matter. And it is a good and godly thing to dress modestly. Now, you can respond and say, well, modesty is just a social construct. And, you know, what about tribes in, in the jungle? They may not, like, buy into that and they, they dress very differently. I understand it is a social construct, but that doesn't deconstruct the idea altogether. Modesty is important. And I'll, I'll say one more thing. Um, it's interesting that in our day, in the 21st century in America, uh, did you know that when couples divorce... 70% of divorces are initiated by women. And among college-educated women in marriage, 90% are initiated by women. Certainly, there are biblical reasons for many of those divorces to, to happen. But there are also plenty of them where there are not biblical reasons for divorce. And so, one of the most important ways that we as a church can support um, ministry and the, the flourishing of our people is for marriages simply to remain intact for the rest of your life and for you to keep your promises. And so we want to do all that we can to support that. Now, if you are in a position where something, you, you know, you, you've been divorced or you, you've got, maybe you were the victim of it, maybe you were the cause of it, you need to know too that there is forgiveness and grace and repentance, earnest, honest repentance brings forgiveness through the cross of Jesus Christ. So can I get an amen on that? That's good news. No matter where you are in this, and we're all sinners in one respect or another in this regard. Now, maybe you have sort of, um, you've overcome this. Praise God if you have. I was actually talking to a guy who is um, a couple decades older than me, and, and we were talking about this issue, and he said, David, I don't know if I've really overcome this sin or if I've just aged out of this sin. Either way, uh, we are called and commanded to fight, and that is precisely what David does not do. He says, who is that woman? And what is the answer? Oh, that's Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, the wife. That should have been the end of it for David because he knew Uriah. Uriah was one of his best warriors. Instead, what does it say? David sent messengers, verse 4, and took her, took her. And that verb is used a thousand times in the Old Testament. And it means to take, not to persuade, not to ask. David is clearly abusing his power as the king. And she comes to him, and, and then she returns to her house, and she gives word that she is pregnant. Um, this is a problem for David. And so David seeks to solve it by bringing in precisely the husband of Bathsheba. And here we find this wicked king engaging with the noble warrior Uriah. Uriah is a Hittite. Here's another example in the scriptures that though the people of God are God's special people and there is ethnicity that, that um, defines who God's people are, God is always looking universally to redeem people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. Uriah the Hittite, the Hittites were people of the land who were not Israelites, and they go back to Abraham. Abraham bought land from the Hittites so that he could have a burial plot for his family. That's the first time we see the Hittites. Uriah is one of them, and he is one of the greatest warriors in David's army, and he brings him back. And he brings him back ostensibly just to find out what's going on at the war front. You know, Uriah, uh, we're, we're friends. Let's hang out and talk. How are things going? How's Joab? Oh, and by the way, great to see you. Why don't you go home and spend the night with your wife? Isn't it good to be back in town? Didn't you miss her? Go home and enjoy the comforts of home. Uriah leaves and he parks himself right outside the palace and sleeps in the same place as the servants. And David gets wind of it, and he's like, what are you doing? And what does Uriah say? How could I go and enjoy the comforts and the pleasures of home when my fellow brothers are in tents, when the ark of the Lord that has the Ten Commandments is, is in a tent? How could I do that? And so David, he redoubles his efforts. Well, have dinner with me tonight, and then you can go back tomorrow. 
and he plies him with drink and food and gets him hammered. And Uriah still does not go home. Do you see how this is the contrast? Like Uriah is the photo negative of David. And Uriah, stone cold drunk, has more integrity than King David, the man who's supposed to be the representative of God to the people, who's supposed to be the shepherd of his people, and instead of being the shepherd, has taken one of the sheep and taken advantage of her. And it doesn't work. And Uriah goes back. And for his integrity, he gets killed. Again, we see no good deed goes unpunished. And sometimes, when you are faithful to the Lord, the result of that faithfulness is you go through a terrible time. And you might even die for it. That's what happens to Uriah. And so they go to the, where the fighting is fiercest. And David tells Joab to pull back and keep Uriah there. And he dies. And other men die as well. He sacrifices not just Uriah, but other men. And word goes back to David. And is David remorseful? Does he regret? Uh, you know what he says? Just tell Joab, don't let this matter displease you, for the sword devours now one and now another in the most cynical tone possible. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it and, and encourage him. And then, after a time, he brings Bathsheba to be an additional wife. And by the way, the Bible talks about polygamy in the Old Testament. It is never condoned, and every time there's polygamy, there's all kinds of rivalries and issues and sinful devastation. Same is true for David, but he brings Bathsheba in, and it's all neat and tidy, except for one thing. Look at the very last sentence. The thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Make no mistake, God sees and knows everything. And if we will not come clean with our sins, there will be a time where it will be made known. And we ought not to wait for that time because that will be a very painful time either in this life or when we stand before him. And so we see in the, the next chapter, and I didn't put that in the text for Ken to read. I just didn't want him to fall down out of exhaustion from reading so much scripture. But in the next chapter, Nathan is a prophet and He's sent to David, and he says, David, listen to this. In your kingdom, in another city, there's this rich man who has all kinds of flocks and herds and fields. And there was a poor man who's his neighbor. And this poor man, he has this little family. And he bought this ewe lamb, this little baby lamb. And he cared for it like it was one of his own daughters. Yes, David, he cared for it like strange 21st century Americans do their dogs. And he gave it table food. And he cared for it. And this rich man, his neighbor, had a guy come from another country and he was entertaining him. He had all these flocks and herds. You know what he did? He took that little ewe lamb from his poor neighbor, the only one he owned, the one who was like a daughter to him, and he slaughtered it and he fed it to this, this visitor. Can you believe that? You know what David said? He deserves to die, and he's going to pay back four times what he took from that poor man. And then Nathan, in one of the most powerful lines in all the Bible, and I imagine he looked him dead in the eye, you are the man to you and he rebukes him and he says why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight you have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife wife. Now, David, to his credit, immediately repents, and he is, and our God is so patient and gracious and merciful, he forgives David. And one of the most beautiful psalms that was written, Psalm 51, it's a psalm of repentance, and, and I encourage you to, to read it this week. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love is how it begins, Psalm 51, and, and David just pours his heart out in repentance. At least he didn't, you know, kill Nathan when he confronted him. I mean, the, that's a pretty low bar, by the way. He does repent, demonstrating that God forgives all who repent, that his grace and mercy are greater than all of our sins. And so if you're feeling conviction right now about any of these sins that we've been talking about, 
there is, there is forgiveness. It requires repentance. And David does repent. And he is forgiven. But that doesn't mean there aren't unbelievably devastating consequences for his sin. And anytime there's familial sexual sin, do not fool yourself. There is tremendous, um, there, there's, there's collateral damage all over the place. And there is in this case. And in particular, the massive collateral damage rests primarily with this misfit mother, Bathsheba. Because she is taken advantage of first, and then she becomes pregnant, and she must be terrified. And then her husband is killed. Did she even know how it happened? Who knows? But he's killed. And so she laments, the text says she laments over her husband. And then she's taken into David's home, and she becomes his wife. And, and they seem to amazingly have some measure of relationship and respect for one another, but, but their son dies. And then she has to lament the death of their son. This is one tragedy after another for this poor woman. Amazingly, they have another son together, and his name, you've probably heard it before, is Solomon. And Solomon grows up to be king. And so she incredibly becomes the queen mother. This is not an unmixed blessing because Solomon's life, it, it follows the trajectory roughly of his father, David. It starts out brilliantly. And then he is turned by the same exact sin. And he follows a trajectory of darkness and downwardness and and the rest of the kings follow in his pattern and certainly the queen mother Bathsheba saw some of this so her life is incredibly difficult it's not without its blessings certainly but we um, we can draw a conclusion from all of this and that is sin is incredibly serious and familial and sexual sin has tremendous fallout but there is forgiveness and there is doing what God wants us to do with what we have. So I want to reiterate to all of us, some of you may feel deep conviction about sins in your past or your present, sexual sins or, or otherwise. Maybe you played a part in a divorce. Maybe you were the cause of the divorce. Let's say you're remarried now. You know what the best thing is that you can do? You can receive forgiveness and make your marriage as Christ-honoring as it can possibly be. And you can do what Paul did, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, go down the path to win the prize to which God has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus. That is what we are to do. So young men, please listen to me. If this is a sin you are struggling with, talk to someone and ask for accountability, and repent, and get help, because the patterns that you set right now in your life are going to have an impact for the rest of your life. And um, for those of you who are married, safeguard your marriage. Make your marriage the number one relationship in your earthly life, because it is the number one relationship in your earthly life. And know that um, in all of this, God is a God of grace and mercy and forgiveness. And, and you know, we see in, in Matthew, um, he, he lists Uriah's wife rather than simply Bathsheba. Why does he do this? Simply to remind us that Jesus came from sinners to save sinners. And just as David was the father of Solomon, Bathsheba was taken from Uriah. It's all right there. And so we, we don't have this lionized version of David. We have the sinful version, the real version of David. And yet still, the king comes through King David. And where David failed utterly in his mission to be the shepherd of his people, to be the faithful king, his downfall stands in stark contrast to who? To the king who's come. To King Jesus, the one who was born humbly, who came to serve, who laid down his life, who rose from the dead, and who offers forgiveness and grace and eternal life to all who would come to him. 
So if you are not a Christian, you need to know that God came, he, he sent Jesus to come to rescue you from your sin. He came to set you free from your sin. You were made for a relationship with God. You have broken that relationship with God. The only thing that you can do to make it right is to admit that you are a sinner and to cry out for the grace of God in Jesus and you can do that right here and now. And if you have not done that, I, I beg you, come to the cross. Come to the cross of Christ. Ask and receive forgiveness and commit your life to following him and putting away sin. And for those of us who are brothers and sisters in Christ, put away your sin. Jesus tells us to, to cut off our hand, to gouge out our eye if it causes us to sin. That is proverbial, but it does imply doing everything you can to put away your sin. May we encourage one another to do so. And all the more, every day that we get closer to standing before him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And we thank you so much that, um, that though we are all sinners, you forgive. And Lord, I pray, for, I pray for people in this room, men, women who are struggling in this area of life in one way or another. Lord, would you give them the courage to repent and would you give them uh, friendships, brother to brother or sister to sister relationships that will help them to fight temptation, to be pure and to, um, to honor you in that regard. Lord, we pray that we would be so different from the culture, so different from the world around us that people would notice and that uh, it would be to your praise and glory. Lord, I pray, for every, I pray for every marriage represented in this room. Would you strengthen our marriages? Would you give us um, marriages that, that honor you? I pray for those who are not yet married, our young people. Lord, give them a vision for Christian marriage. And Lord, I pray that all of us would simply seek to honor you and obey you, repenting all the way. Father, we love you and we praise you and we pray now according to how Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.